Hey there. I'm going to try and get through this without uh, too much craziness or emotion. Um, my name is Dawn Thompson, and I am the founder and president of Improving Birth. And I'm also a mom of six, four of whom I birthed. Um, and, you know, a lot of women are asked the question, are you nuts or some variation of that question when they say that they're going to have a vaginal birth after cesarean attempt a vaginal birth after cesarean and um, I decided to read my birth story I've shared my birth story out there um, I'm actually gonna turn this into a video blog I mean a um, also a blog post so if you would like to share that you'll be able um, it'll be on our website at improvingbirth.org. Um, so I just I just wanted to share my VBAC story um, after three cesareans, which makes me even more nuts, apparently. Um, and I'm sharing this with the hope to encourage others who may not have that support system and who may not have a team of people encouraging them um, to, to go for it, you know? So... Um, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go for it so um, I was 20 when I got pregnant with my first child I made all the typical assumptions back then I went to my primary care doctor for an OB referral having absolutely no idea I had other options I thought I'd go to that OB and he would tell me all I needed to know about birth and whatever he didn't tell me I'd learn in that Lamaze class Lamaze class that was offered at the hospital. And then I'd be on my merry way to have a baby. They talked about C-sections in that class, but I didn't really listen because it was, it was just not gonna happen to me. I mean, how many people have felt that way? And the only reading that I did was the obligatory what to expect when you're ex expecting. Uh, and really, frankly, I was way more focused on the baby's nursery and the kind of new gadgets that I was going to get for this little person that was living inside of me and, you know, clothes once I knew that it was a girl. I also made a lot of the typical things that I know now as a doula as first time parent mistakes. One of them was like running to the hospital at the first sign of labor. And I was only two to three centimeters dilated when I arrived. And instead of going home, which to be honest, I really, I'm not even sure I knew was an option, I was admitted. Back then, the, they monitored constantly, and I know in some hospitals they still do, that is not evidence-based, by the way. Um, but, and on top of that, they made me lie only on my left side. I literally had no idea that I could do anything else. They kept coming in and saying, you need to lay on your left side, you need to lay on your left side. And I didn't realize that I was now on some sort of clock. So after laboring through the night, the contraction slowed significantly and there was not much change in my dilation. I wasn't really in labor yet, but I didn't know that. The doctor came in in the morning to do his rounds and said I needed Pitocin. Well, he's the doctor. If he says that's what I need, that must be what I need. But little did I know that it was really just the beginning of that snowball effect that I hear about so often now. You know, Pitocin, epidural, no change in my cervix, let's break the water, baby's in distress, fetal monitor on your head, on the baby's head, wires and cords were literally coming out of every orifice of my body, it felt. And I just, I just didn't even know what to do. And then suddenly things were changing really fast. The baby was showing signs of distress. We need to do a C-section right now. There's suddenly lots of people in my room and then they're running me down to the, the, the hall to the OR. And oh, hallelujah, they saved my baby's life. They saved my life. Your baby's just too big to fit, or so they told me afterwards. You're lucky you were here. Back in the day, you would have been one of those women who died in childbirth. 
Those were the exact words from my doctor as he sat on the edge of the bed. It'd be many years later that I would hear the phrase pit to distress. And at the time though, I hung on the idea that they had saved her, that she and I may have died if they'd not intervened. And I love the drama of that story. Ugh, I loved it so much, I couldn't help but tell it. I wanted to tell everyone that drama. It made sense to me, right? It was a reason for why I had to be cut open. When I got pregnant with my second child, there was no question about whether or not I was gonna try for a vaginal birth. I spent my entire pregnancy though being told by my doctor that it was ris risky, I really shouldn't do it, but with no real facts to support anything that he was telling me. And he was kind of eh about it. They didn't ban VBACs as much as they do now then. So, but no one understood me, uh, underst around me stood, understood why I wanted to schedule, a, I didn't want to schedule a C-section. But recovering from a cesarean was no joke and I didn't want to experience that again. So during labor with him, the back labor was horrible. Then to make matters worse, the nurse reminded me on several occasions that no one really ever has VBACs. It just doesn't work. Why are you putting yourself through this? After a few hours of back labor, I decided that she and everyone else must be right. Go ahead. There must just be. There must just be something wrong with my body. Cut him out. And they did. Another big baby. That must be it. I just can't birth big babies. Years later, I would become a doula and learn the ins and outs of birth. I would suddenly process my births all over again, but this time with the truth about a broken system that bases decisions more on liability and financial concerns than what might be have been best for me and my baby. My passion grew like wildfire and I could not get enough. I literally, I wanted everyone to know the truth. Why aren't women being told these things? Why aren't they being given all of the information to make these decisions? And the anger would come and the frustration and the desire to save everyone. But reality comes crashing in at some point. I can't save them all, no matter how passionate I am. I can only help the ones that seek me out. I couldn't talk to the random moms in the park about why their C-section may not have been necessary. They didn't get it, nor did they even want to hear it. I realized quickly that they must be, they, they had to be ready and have the desire to even know. But on the other hand, like moths to a flame, the VBAC mom started seeking me out. You know, the universe has a way about that, right? You attract things after a while. And doctors who supported doulas started referring their VBAC patients to me often. I became the VBAC queen. I loved helping those families have successful VBACs. I wanted to be that cheerleader telling them that they could, knowing that they were being bombarded by people who said that they couldn't. It also helped me heal from my own pain. After six years of being a doula, I would finally get my chance. I would fix it all feel all the pain, heal all the pain and the disappointment. And I'd not only have a vaginal birth, but I'd do it at home and I'd do it with no drugs. It had been 12 years since my last child. I had so much knowledge. This would be great. It would be great, I was sure of it. When my labor finally started, everything seemed to be going great, except my back was really hurting. No matter how much prep work I had done to make sure she was in a good position, she never budged from way back in the back of my right side. But I didn't care. I was going to do it, back labor or not. Once active labor began, I didn't tell anyone about the sharp burning pain in front near my incision site with every surge. I knew full well that I'd be off to the hospital in no time because it was a clear sign that something wasn't right but there was no way I was going to the hospital. Besides, I was progressing well. When she had arrived, I was already six centimeters. 
further than either of my previous two births. I progressed to eight centimeters only two hours later and the baby was so low. I kept feeling the urge to push. It would come and I'd begin to push, but my back, damn it, my back. Then the sharp burning pain would shoot through me and I'd have to stop pushing. It just hurt too much, but I did it repeatedly over and over again for four hours. Something wasn't right. And eventually my surges spaced out from two minutes apart to 20 minutes apart. I told my midwife that something just had to change, break my water or something. So out of the water I went, I was in the hot tub the whole time and up the stairs to my bedroom so that she could monitor the baby while she broke my water. She didn't even have to though, broke on its own, just as she was getting ready to do the exam. When she did my exam, I knew something was wrong. I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm still the same. I'm gonna be still eight centimeters, but it was way worse than that. My baby had gone back up and my cervix has closed down to three centimeters. I had been eight centimeters for hours and now I was three. I'm pretty sure my eyes literally bugged out of my head. I was so over it. They tried to convince me to stay and rest because I was getting good breaks in between, but I knew I had to tell them about the sharp burning pain I'd been dealing with. Needless to say, there was zero discussion after that and I was off to the hospital. Listen, I would share all the hassles of what happened at the hospital and the craziness of it. Um, it took from 9.30 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon before my daughter was finally born via cesarean. Uh, there was just a lot of challenges and it was really frustrating. But I wound up in surgery for almost two hours because I had so much scar tissue. It was so thick, it prevented my baby from moving into a good position and the pulling of the scar was what was causing the burning. I was devastated. My previous C-sections would come back to haunt me after all. I never imagined this could happen. Here I was the VBAC queen. I had all the knowledge. How could this happen to me? No one doubted for a minute that my home birth VBAC would happen. My birthy friends, thankfully, all looked on the bright side. Now that scar tissue was gone and when you have another baby, would be different. And only four months later, I would find out that I was pregnant again. Believe me, nobody plans that. <laughs> I worried, I worried so much. Had enough time passed for my scar to heal? Was I crazy for wanting to try again? Would I hurt myself? Would I hurt my baby? Everyone supported me and loved me into believing that I just had to try again. I wouldn't just throw in the towel. I'd be better prepared for the possibility and likelihood of another cesarean this time. But I just had to try. All my due dates are just started, but I knew it was early and my instinct told me it would be a couple days still. The next day, the surges were still there, stronger, but pretty far apart. That night though, I knew it was gonna be a long one. I was able to sleep only for an hour, when it became obvious that sleeping was no longer an option, I relaxed with my hypnobirthing babies, my hypno, my hypno baby CD, and I rocked in a chair alone for several hours in the dark. The surges were still only 10 minutes apart or so, but by 3 a.m. they were rocking my world. Strong, powerful, six minutes apart. It was time to call in the troops. My husband woke up and called my doula. She lives close by, so she arrived just 20 minutes later. My husband had explained how far apart they were, only to have four surges come in the first 12 minutes. Things were really starting to pick up. The next call went to the midwives, who had come about an hour later. Everything seemed perfect. I was not having any of the same feelings I'd had with the last birth, except for my back. My back was beginning to hurt again, even though I knew he was in a great position. I still worried. Would I be only three centimeters? I worried about silly things like that, even though I was in such great pattern and everything. So at my request, my midwife checked me right away when she got here. I was almost complete, just a small lip. 
I cried. I was so happy. There were zero, no words. So back in the water I went because it was the only reprieve I could get from the back labor. Wait until the urge to push comes, they said. But it just didn't come. And my back, my damn back, it was excruciating. All the feeling from my last birth came rushing in. I felt like I was on this horrible roller coaster ride and I couldn't get off. I was doing the same loop over and over and over again. Maybe if I just tried to push. Oh, oh God, no. Oh, God, no, that hurt. Let's check again, she said. I think I feel scar tissue. Are you serious right now? Scar tissue? Wasn't I the one who just gotten all the attention about writing an article about scar tissue and the issues it causes during labor for my clients? I never considered for a second that I had it myself. I'm pretty sure my exact words were rub the crap out of it then. She explained that it wouldn't feel very good and I responded that it couldn't possibly be worse than what I was already experiencing. There was some cursing and homeopathics involved and off I went trying different positions and then eventually back in the water. Listen, I'm pretty sure from this point forward, I used up a good year supply of curse words. Um, my favorite being the F word. And I don't normally talk this way, but for whatever reason, it was the only word in my vocabulary that seemed strong enough to express myself. It had power. So lots of whining commenced as well, though. I can't do this, you guys. Seriously, I can't. I would literally say this to anyone who would listen. My mom, my doula, my husband, my midwife, the co mid like everyone. I would literally change people hoping that someone would take my side, but they all just kept saying that I could do it and that I needed to stop saying that I couldn't. It's what you wanted. The F I did, I didn't sign up for this shit. Then I would change and start chanting during the surge and I would say, I can do this, I can do this. And then halfway through I'd say, no, I can't. Please take me to the hospital. It's not working, just cut him out, forget it. I did start feeling pressure a bit, so I tried to push, but it hurt like hell. But I had to try and I pushed and I pushed and nothing changed and I could feel in my body that nothing was changing and so I just went back to whining and cussing again. Let's go inside and check again. See if the babies move down more. And my response was no, no, I'm done. The baby is not coming out. I've been pushing with all of my might and he's not budging. And oh yeah, by the way, it hurts like a mother effer. But up the stairs I went anyways, whining all the way. I was a whiner of epic proportion. I was literally ready to drive myself to the hospital, call a cab, whatever it took to get there. I didn't care. Let's just push back past the slip. You can do it. Everyone just started chanting, come on, Don. Come on, you can do it. My husband is saying, come on, honey, you can do this. I'm pushing and screaming because, oh my God, it hurts. Here he comes, you're doing it. No, I'm not. No, he's not coming. I don't feel him coming. You're all just saying that. I'm gonna be here for the next two hours pushing and he won't even come. I'm not gonna do it. I'm, and I'm still pushing my guts out while I'm saying all of these things. And I hear my husband beside me say, honey, I see his head. No, you don't. Come on, Don, push. Why would we lie to you? Look, touch his head. I don't feel it. Push again. Oh my God. The pressure suddenly. Okay, maybe he is coming. Don, he's crowning. Feel his head again. Holy crap. He really is there and I could feel his wrinkly head. But wow, that ring of fire is for real. Come on, Don. 
nice and slow now. Ease your baby out. Slow, slow. Now stop. The relief of his head coming out was so fabulous. But now, what about the rest of him? Is he stuck? What's up with that? Come on. Like, seriously. I just wanted the rest of him to slip out like I'd seen a hundred times, but no. I had to push every inch of this guy out. I should have known he was big. Dawn, get your baby. It took me a minute. I literally, I could not wrap my head around what was happening and what they were saying to me. Dawn, get your baby. And I did. And I reached down and I put my hands under his arms and I pulled him the rest of the way out onto my chest with pure disbelief. Only 20 minutes had passed since I was calling that cab to get me. And here he was in my arms, on my bed at home, nearly a full pound larger than any of my other babies. So much for that theory. I share this story because I know so many people were just like me in my first birth. I just didn't understand that there was so much to learn and understand and that the system is not built in our favor. Education is crucial. One of the things that frustrates me the most about the high cesarean rate and low VBAC rate is that when, when, when women are discussing their options, it's only focused on the immediate risks of surgery, which granted are low. But we don't tell them about the long-term risks to both them and their babies. They're not being told about the significant increased risk of obesity and asthma and gut issues or the long-term effects of increased risk of having to, to need a, a, a hysterectomy and bowel obstruction from scar tissue and scar tissue issues, which I still deal with today. We are not being given all of the information to make informed choices. And it's an inexcusable shame. I think it's important to mention that there was not a single hospital in my community that would allow me and support my informed decision because I was extremely informed about, uh, it, it, they would not allow me to attempt a vaginal birth after three cesareans. At the time, no one would let you do after one cesarean. At least there's a couple now that will support after two cesareans, but after that, nothing. And even though the reality is the hospital would have been the safest place, right? If there was, a, if there'd been an emergency. Anyways, to those deciding on having a VBAC or not, the fear never really leaves you until that baby's in your arms. I wish I could tell you that the more information you have, then you'll, the, you won't be afraid. But the reality is the more information you have, the less afraid you are. But it's never completely gone until you're holding that baby. But information is power. VBAC Facts has an incredible resource with handouts and workshops for both birth workers and families and professionals. I highly recommend it. If you are a birth person and you have the possibility, which, you know, when one in three women is having cesareans, if you are a doula, you will be supporting VBACs. You need to get over to VBAC Facts and get educated yourself too. And I think that I made myself really clear in this story that it would have never happened if I didn't have the birth team that I had. It turned out that I was literally the only one in the room who didn't believe I could do it. 
Imagine if my provider didn't believe in me or the nurse or the whoever is around you doesn't believe you. You're less likely, certainly less likely to believe in you when you are in the throes of birth. Surrounding yourself with the right people is crucial. And you can, we actually have an article on the Improving Birth website called The 10 Steps to Finding a VBAC Supportive Provider. It can help guide you find the right team because it absolutely matters. Where you give birth and with whom you give birth matters. So am I nuts? Was I nuts? <laughs> there are people who would say so, but in the end, my son by far is the healthiest of all my children at nearly eight years old. His immune system is robust and I feel so deeply connected to him. My other babies were taken from me right after birth. I didn't see them for three and four hours. But listen, VBAC is a deeply, deeply personal choice. And it's not for everyone. And certainly there are medical indications for not having one. But unfortunately for many, they don't even have the option. So many providers don't even offer an option which goes against, by the way, all major health organizations, including ACOG, who just released new guidelines for VBAC, which are really great. There's still a few things that we could change, but we're getting there. So if you're con considering a VBAC, weigh all your options information to make the best decision for you. And if the best decision for you and your family is a cesarean, then we support you. But for those who want a VBAC, it's possible. But you have to be ready and you have to prepare. Thanks, you guys.